Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today on Heritage Events Live. My name is Luke Coffey, and it is my pleasure to welcome everyone to today's event, Deal or No Deal, the Iran Nuclear Challenge. In May 2018, after a very deliberate process lasting months, the Trump administration decided to withdraw from the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, also known as the JCPOA, or more informally, the Iran Deal. And the administration then began imposing severe economic sanctions as part of its so-called maximum pressure strategy to extract a better agreement with Iran. Now, to tee up today's discussion, I want to make two quick points about the deal when in the earlier days, back in 2015 and 2016, when Americans were sold this deal by the Obama administration. Firstly, Americans were sold this deal with the claim that this deal would stop Iran from ever getting a nuclear bomb. But when the facts of the deal were made public, we learned that there are certain sunset clauses, uh, such as on the enrichment of uranium, that ended after or expired after a number of years. So this uh, deal didn't stop Iran from ever getting a nuclear bomb. It just merely delayed the process. Americans were also sold that this Iran deal would change the behavior of the regime. And looking back over the past few years since Iran agreed to the JCPOA, this hasn't happened at all. Since joining the JCPOA, Iran has conducted covert attacks on oil shipping, proxy attacks against US forces in Iraq and Syria, and drone missile attacks against Saudi oil facilities. But yet Iran insists that the JCPOA should be revived with no changes. So what should the US position be and how should US policymakers approach this? To discuss this today, we have a great panel lined up for you. And I'm delighted to invite our first speaker, Jim Phillips, on screen. Jim Phillips is a senior research fellow for the Middle East at the Heritage Foundation. He is a veteran foreign policy specialist who has written widely on the Middle East and other related issues and international terrorism since joining the Heritage Foundation in 1979. He has authored dozens of papers on Iran, its nuclear program, and the use of terrorism, and he has testified before Congress on Iran's nuclear program and other Middle East security issues. So with that, I turn it over to you, Jim. Thank you, Luke. Uh, as a presidential candidate earlier this year, Joe Biden made it clear that he's committed to reviving the Iran nuclear deal. In an op-ed for CNN in September, uh, Biden wrote, uh, if Iran returns to strict compliance, the U.S. would rejoin the agreement as a starting point for follow-on negotiations. Uh, Jake Sullivan, Biden's choice for national security advisor, said last week that the new administration will first attempt to put Iran back into the box of the nuclear deal and only then move forward to a, a follow-on negotiation to include Iran's missile program and its regional behavior. There are many problems with this formulation and I'd like to briefly uh, sketch out some of the uh, potential pitfalls and minefields that are inherent in this approach. Uh, first, the nuclear deal did not put Iran into a very strong box. It put Iran in a situation in which key non-proliferation restrictions gradually sunset uh, as Luke mentioned, and that would allow Tehran to expand its uranium enrichment activities to an industrial scale and set the stage for a possible sprint to a nuclear breakout if Iran shrugs off its non-proliferation commitments as it has done so many times before. Uh, that is to say that the walls of the box that Iran had been placed in gradually would dissolve and become paper thin. The Biden administration needs to think outside this box. Uh, the Obama JCPOA box was poorly designed from the beginning, and the U.S. cannot afford to return to the old deal because that deal did too little for too short a time to effectively restrict Iran's nuclear ambitions. The U.N. arms embargo already has lapsed as scheduled under the deal after only five years. Ridiculously short sunset clauses remove key non-proliferation restrictions on uranium enrichment after 10 to 15 years. Secondly, if Washington lifts its nuclear sanctions and returns to the old deal, 
then it will squander its main source of leverage and forfeit any chance of reaching an acceptable outcome in follow-on negotiations on other issues. Instead, a Washington should seek a new agreement that rectifies the major flaws of the old deal, including by extending the time frame of the nuclear restrictions, adding restrictions on ballistic missile development, and requiring Tehran to come clean about its past nuclear weapons efforts. Third, the world has changed significantly since the JCPOA was negotiated five years ago. In 2018, Iran's nuclear archive was stolen and revealed by Israel's Mossad intelligence agency, exposing Iran's detailed plans for building and testing five nuclear devices, among other things. Uh, these plans reportedly were shelved by 2003 when Iran's nuclear weapons program was downsized and reorganized, probably out of fear of a U.S. military response, as in uh, neighboring Iraq. But the fact that Tehran retained the nuclear archive shows that it wanted to preserve its nuclear plans and maintain the option of taking them off the shelf again at some point. Therefore, the JCPOA was built on the foundation of Iranian deception from the very start. The nuclear archive was not known by the Obama administration before the JCPOA, and that proved that Iran did not come clean on its nuclear weapons program. To clear the way for the 2015 deal, the International Atomic Energy Agency uh, was pressured to close the books on Iran's past activities and uh, downplay issues related to Iran's undeclared nuclear work. Out outstanding questions were left unresolved. Iran was required to respond to the questions posed by the IAEA, but under the terms of the nuclear deal, those responses could remain incomplete, untruthful, and unverifiable. And yet, sanctions relief followed. Washington should demand that Tehran must come clean on its past nuclear weapons efforts or negotiations are off. Any new nego negotiations must reflect the new facts contained in the nuclear archive. Uh, the U.S. cannot trust Iran to fulfill its non-proliferation promises in the future unless Iran owns up to its nuclear activities in the past. My fourth point is that in addition to its premature sunset conditions, the nuclear deal was criticized because it neglected Iran's ballistic missile program. And that's an inherently uh, important part of any nuclear weapons program. Uh, even Germany, uh, which historically has given Iran the benefit of the doubt on many issues, even Germany has called for the inclusion of ballistic missiles in any future agreement. Foreign Minister Heiko Maas asserted earlier this month, a return to the previous deal uh, will not suffice. There will have to be a kind of nuclear agreement plus, which is also in our interest. We have clear expectations of Iran, no nuclear weapons and no ballistic missile program that threatens the entire region. Fifth, in addition to the substance of negotiations, the administration also must be mindful of the process through which it legitimizes any deal. It must not repeat uh, what I call the Obama administration's original sin, that is trying to bypass Congress on the issue by instead going to the UN for validation. A sustainable agreement requires bipartisan buy-in from Congress. And the first thing Congress should do uh, in the new year is demand that the administration structure any future nuclear deal as a treaty to be approved by the Senate. Trying to do an end run around Congress will only boost the odds that the agreement will eventually collapse as the last one did when rejected by a new administration. Sixth, I think the negotiations are likely to be much more difficult than many expect because Iran seeks to re-enter the old deal with absolutely no modifications. Iranian Foreign Minister uh, Mohammad Zarif has ruled out negotiating any changes in the JCPOA. He told a conference in Italy uh, earlier this month that it will never be re renegotiated, period. 
President Rouhani has chimed in on December 9th saying that the nuclear deal could be restored without negotiations. Uh, it's impossible to imagine that happening, but those statements reflect the urgency for the regime to lift sanctions and also reflect Rouhani's desire to safeguard his legacy, which in large part boils down to preserving the JCPOA. Iran's ultra hardliners who have attacked Rouhani for the JCPOA also have weighed in by passing a law on December 1st that set a 60 day deadline for the US to lift sanctions. If the US doesn't do so, by the law, uh, Iran is required to raise uranium enrichment levels to 20% from its current level of 3 to 5%, and, and that's a huge raise, install more advanced centrifuges, and kick out international inspectors. These threats, made to put pressure on the US, will also put pressure on the Europeans who still cling to the JCPOA, and it will put pressure on them to finally admit that the deal is dead. Uh, if Tehran follows through on these threats, it could lead the EU3, UK, uh, France, and Germany, uh, who have been in part of these negotiations from the beginning, to finally take action by declaring Iran to be in the breach of the G JCPOA and the triggering snapback UN sanctions. Uh, that would be a good thing, not only because it would escalate pressure on Iran, but also because it would finally drive a stake through the heart of the zombie 2015 nuclear deal, which remains dead, but not buried. And to reach a new deal, the old deal must be uh, cleared away. Uh, Iran essentially is saying that it's the old deal or no deal at all, uh, despite the fact that it's desperate to lift sanctions. If Washington fall, fails to call this bluff, and unwisely returns to the original deal, then it will continue to face the same problems that arose under the old deal, only the sunset provisions will come five years sooner, uh, which would be crazy. Iran once again will pocket billions of dollars in sanctions relief that it will plow into its aggressive military interventions in, in Syria, Iraq, and Yemen, in escalating its military buildup, now unencumbered by the UN arms embargo, it, it will invest it in its network of proxy forces or even in its nuclear program. Immediately re-entering the JCPOA would let Iran off the hook and squander the powerful diplomatic leverage linked to the sanctions ramped up by the Trump administration. This would also reduce the chances of a follow-on agreement uh, that uh, the new administration says it wants. Although Washington should leave the door open for diplomacy, there should be no return to the old deal. A much more restrictive agreement is required to permanently and indisputably end Iran's nuclear weapons ambition. So uh, for me, the bottom line is the, the US position should be uh, a new deal or there is no deal. Uh, thanks, Luke. Thank you, uh, Jim, for those very, uh concise remarks, hitting all the main points, setting up this discussion very nicely. I think our audience appreciated that. Uh, I would like um, uh, to ask David Albright to come on screen. And Jim, you can go off. Thank you. David Albright's our next speaker. David is a physicist and the founder and president of the Nonprofit Institute for, for Science and International Security in Washington, DC. He directs the project work of the Institute, heads its fundraising efforts, and chairs its board of directors. And of course, it's we should never pass up an opportunity to plug an upcoming project or book. He has an upcoming book to be published early next year with co-author Andrea Stricker on Iran's nuclear weapons program. And this book will be building off Iran's secret nuclear archive that was seized in Tehran by Israel in 2018. And Jim Phillips actually referenced that uh, in his uh, remarks earlier. So uh, David, uh, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, appreciate the opportunity to talk about Iran. Um, I think at its best, the nuclear deal did not settle the nuclear question. Um, it's already been mentioned, the sunsets on the nuclear limitations are a problem, but also inadequate verification arrangements over potential and actual military nuclear activities. The deal was certainly ill-equipped ill -equipped to settle Iranian missile issues or any of the multiple regional conflicts in play for years. 
But even on a fundamental nuclear proliferation question, the JCPOA did not settle the question of whether Iran had or has an ongoing nuclear weapons program. At best, it kicked this key issue to the IEA, which so far has been unable to make much progress in determining one way or the other. This inability is registered every three months by the International Atomic Energy Agency reporting that it cannot determine or certify Iran's nuclear program as peaceful. An unexpected development outside the JCPOA, which Jim raised, uh, happened in early 2018 when Israel seized a cache of top secret Iranian documents and CDs in Tehran about Plan Ahmad, Iran's crash nuclear weapons program in the early 2000s. Its goal was to build five nuclear weapons, four deliverable by missile, and one held in reserve for an underground nuclear test. Importantly, international pressure, Jim mentioned the presence of US troops next door, inadvertently led Iran in 2003 and 2004 to secretly end the Ahmad plan. However, the documents in the archives show that Iran did not end its nuclear weapons program. Instead, it downsized and reconstituted it. The documents also show a nuclear weapons program that was far larger and more advanced than thought before the discovery of the archive. The archive has also opened a pathway to more effective inspections, inspections that could be jeopardized by merely rejoining the JCPOA. Based on documents in the archive and its own investigations, the IA has alleged that Iran has undeclared nuclear material and activities. It has pressed Iran for access to two sites and asked for Iran to truly cooperate. After months of refusing and un under international pressure, Iran agreed to allow IA access to these two sites. However, Iran's decision has only been tactical, a way to deflect international pressure and further split the United States from Europe. It did not represent a desire to truly cooperate with, with the IAEA. It routinely calls the archive documents forgeries. The two visits did happen and we are awaiting the results. But overall, the international, international support for the IAEA, IAEA is critical as it seeks answers from Iran. One way to undermine this important IAEA effort is to blindly rejoin the JCPOA. After all, the IAEA is wrestling with the core nuclear question, is Iran's nuclear program peaceful? This issue should be front and center in any re-engagement with, with Iran. Resolving this issue should be a prerequisite for any nuclear deal. Now, where, where is Iran on its nuclear buildup? A measure that we use of that buildup is what we call breakout the amount of time to produce enough weapon grade uranium for a nuclear weapon. That time we now estimate is as short as three to four months and less than six months to produce enough for two weapons. The breakout timelines will reduce further if Iran starts to produce near 20% enriched uranium, an action mandated by a new Iranian law that Jim mentioned. Timelines will further decrease if Iran deploys advanced centrifuges as also demanded by the new law. Now, I would like to discuss briefly, what does an Iranian nuclear weapons program look like today? First, one needs to look more carefully at what defines a nuclear weapons program in a country like Iran. Iran does not appear today to have a program focused on the actual building of nuclear weapons, and, and the international community deserves a lot of credit for that. But it, Iran does appear to have a program to be, prepare, be prepared to do so, and to do so in short order. It is important to emphasize that Iran does not appear to me at least to have a nuclear weapons program like the one in Pakistan or South Africa in the 1970s and 1980s. It did in the Ahmad plan, but that program has been stalled. Also, Iran is, a way, is way beyond what is sometimes called a latent nuclear weapons program, a term sometimes pinned on Japan with its large stock of separated plutonium. What Iran has is a program to produce nuclear weapons on demand. Somebody in Iran is thinking about nuclear weapons, preserving nuclear weapons capabilities, including related information and equipment, advancing nuclear capabilities, and fighting off exposure. We do not know how or if Iran has thought through a precise timeline to a deliverable nuclear weapon following a decision to build nuclear weapons. This is a very difficult question to answer from the outside. There are, two key parts to this question, an underground nuclear test and missile deliverable nuclear weapons. 
in my own work, I assess that Iran is able to conduct an underground nuclear test in six to nine months, assuming current breakout at timelines of three to four months. That type of test would change the Middle East. A nuclear warhead on a missile would take longer. How much longer is hard to determine, but one to two years is often cited, although some think it would involve a shorter time frame. The answer is highly uncertain. Can simply rejoining the JCPOA deal with this type of nuclear weapons program? I think, I think the answer is no, not by itself. In fact, Iran likely supports the JCPOA in part because the nuclear deal does not do well at preventing or exposing such a nuclear weapons program. What should be fixed in a nuclear deal? Briefly, Jim has talked about it. There's a desperate need to improve inspections, including systematic access to military sites and Iran cooperating with the International Atomic Energy Agency. There's a need to extend, or I would argue better, to eliminate the nuclear sunsets, particularly on gas centrifuges should be an effort to limit Iran's nuclear capable missile program. And in this effort, as others, Jim has pointed out, Luke pointed out, the United States has tremendous leverage. I mean, with this, the, the power of the sanctions um, went way beyond any expectations. The Iran nuclear challenge was not solved by the JCPOA or the Trump administration. It is a challenge begging attention, but there is no reason to rush or give in to demands to rejoin. Even shortened breakout times do not justify such action. Rejoining the JCPOA as outlined by Iran and by the European Union leadership and several NGOs would not only be a mistake, but a lost opportunity. Pursuing a more deliberate path to solve this problem may increase tensions in the short run. Arriving in a fix will not be quick, but tensions are likely to rise by reinstituting the JCPOA as presently configured. They certainly did after the deal was implemented in 2016. The way to reduce both conflict and the chances of proliferation is to fix and broaden the JCPOA. The JCPOA had its place, headed off a crisis and bought some time. However, by itself, it is woefully inadequate to deal with the threat of nuclear weapons or ballistic missiles or threats posed by Iran. Thank you, uh, David, for building off uh, Jim's uh, opening remarks and providing in a bit more detail and fleshing out some of the key points. Uh, I would like to now ask Fred Flights to come on screen and David, you can come up, great. Uh, thank you. Um, before I introduce uh, uh, Fred, I would like to remind our audience that they can pose questions in the, uh, feed, the, uh, the question chat feature um, in the webinar program. So please uh, keep the questions coming and then we'll get to them shortly. Um, I would like to introduce our third and final speaker, uh, Mr. Fred Flights. He is the president and the CEO of the Center for Security Policy. He served in 2018 as a deputy assistant to President Donald Trump and chief of staff to then National Security Advisor John Bolton. Fred has extensive national security experience in both the executive and legislative branches uh, of government going back many, many years. So we're very lucky to have him join us today to give his thoughts on the future of the uh, JCPOA. Over to you, Fred. Thank you. Good to be here. I'd like to thank the Heritage Foundation for inviting me to speak to this important forum, uh, Jim Phillips, and uh, also say what a, what a pleasure it is to be on the same panel with David Albright who I think is probably one of the most objective and courageous experts on this subject. And I encourage you to go to his site, which is called The Good ISIS on Twitter, not ISIS if you're looking for it. Uh, it's been evident for some time that if Joe Biden won the election, he was intent on quickly rejoining the nuclear deal with Iran. His advisors have been saying recently that the U.S. will rejoin the deal if Iran comes into full compliance. And Iranian officials have recently indicated that Iran is willing to come into compliance if the U.S. does also. Iran withdrew from all its formal commitments to the agreement by early 2020, and I think that when Iran says it wants the U.S. to come into compliance, it means that the U.S. would have to drop the substantial sanctions put on Iran by President Trump. Um, there's obvious reasons why uh, Democrats want to rejoin this agreement. It was a legacy agreement of President Obama. They claim the agreement worked, that Iran was in compliance. And I think we have to be honest with ourselves, a part of this is payback. 
uh, that the Democrats want to rejoin this deal quickly, basically to stick it to President Trump, who, who um, did a lot of things that proved successful, but the Democrats refused to give him credit for. I think that Biden has to put those impulses in check and recognize the real problems of rejoining this agreement, which, which uh, uh, you've heard already by the other panelists. But I want to list three principal problems that I think have to be addressed by the Biden administration, which I hope will prevent them rejoining this deal. The first one is that this agreement is fatally flawed. It's not just the weak inspection regime, the short timeline, the so-called sunset clauses, the failure of the agreement to address missiles, the fact that it provided Iran with billions of dollars to spend on terrorism, sending troops into regional states, giving uh, uh, missiles to the Houthi rebels in Yemen. This agreement grants Iran the right to enrich uranium. This was granted to Iran in 2011 in talks that John Kerry conducted while he was chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee with Iranian officials. It was an outrageous concession. As long as Iran is allowed to enrich uranium, there cannot be a deal. This is the view of Joe Lieberman. It is a view of Prime Minister Netanyahu. And frankly, when experts around town say that this deal can be fixed by extending it, that would simply be extending a bad deal, which makes no sense. If there's going to be a meaningful nuclear deal with Iran, Iran cannot be allowed to enrich uranium. Right now, it is enriching uranium with thousands of centrifuges and is allowed to, under the nuclear deal, which allows it to improve its capability to make nuclear weapons fuel. Let's make no mistake, Iran has no need to enrich. If it wanted to have fuel for nuclear reactors, it is far more economical to buy it on the open market. It's cheaper. There's a glut of reactor fuel. Iran is doing this to perfect its capability to make nuclear weapons fuel. That was the concession Obama gave to the mullahs to get this terrible deal. So please, when conservatives say we can fix the deal by just extending it, that's not true. The second point is that there is now substantial information of Iranian cheating. Now, we heard from David and, 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 and Jim that the Iranians lied about their prior nuclear program, and that was a progressive progressive to, to get in the agreement. But we know from the Iran nuclear archive documents stolen by Israel, not only did Iran have a substantial program to build nuclear weapons before the JCPOA was set up, but it continued substantial weapons-related activities while the deal was in effect. There's simply no question about this. Now, David mentioned some of these nuclear sites that uh, were revealed in, in, the doc, in these documents. And I might add that once they were revealed in the documents, Iran immediately tried to sanitize them and raise buildings so there'd be no evidence left for the IAEA to find. In Tehran, there was something called the, uh, nu the Tehran Nuclear Warehouse. It contained 300 tons of equipment and 15 kilotons of radioactive material. It took the IAEA a year to get into that uh, facility uh, and by the time it got in there in 2019, it had been cleaned out. But the IAEA still discovered evidence, particles of natural and man-made uranium in the building, meaning that it was housing and rich uranium in violation of the JCPOA. There's no question Iran has been cheating on the agreement, that it was never honest with the agreement in the first place. So when the when Biden and his, and his aides say, well, we're going to rejoin the agreement when Iran comes back into compliance, Iran was never in compliance with this agreement. It's not going to come into compliance if Biden just decides, well, we're going to rejoin the agreement because the Iranians have promised to comply. It has never complied. Iran is engaged in a weak agreement that allows it to continue to move towards a nuclear weapon with our approval. That's what Obama granted to the Iranians. The best approach, the approach that President Trump has, is maximum pressure maximum economic pressure on Iran to deny it the funds it can use for weapons, for missiles, for sponsoring terrorism. But Biden will lift all of those sanctions in exchange for empty promises by the Iranians to stop their nuclear program. Let's hope that that doesn't happen. My final point is that the world has changed since Joe Biden was vice president. Iran is more dangerous. I, I remind you that uh, in September 2019, Iran fired 24 missiles and drones at a Saudi oil refinery. All of them hit and did enormous damage. And earlier this year, Iran fired missiles at two U.S. bases in Iraq. Now, the, the debate is open whether these missiles uh, 
failed or deliberately didn't hit their targets. From, from my research, and some of this is what I did in the government, I think Iran's missiles are now very, very accurate and that they decided not to do too much damage to those bases. This was in retaliation to, to the killing of Soleimani. Um, we have to recognize that this is not the same Iran that, that Joe Biden knew when he left the White House. And if we were to give Iran this huge in, uh, influx of cash by lifting sanctions, and Ron will do what it did in 2016, that money we spent on the military, on terrorism, on, it, on its missile program, on its nuclear program. So, and, and that's Iran's condition for rejoining the agreement. The U.S. has to comply. This would be a big mistake. And finally, Trump has achieved a lot in the Middle East. And you know of these four agreements to normalize relations between Israel and Arab states. This is because the Trump administration built a relationship of trust with Arab states and with Israel to, to convince them that it is in their interest to cooperate for economic reasons, for political reasons, but also the Trump administration united the states in the region against a common enemy, Iran. If we were to begin appeasing Iran again, if the US was to give Iran a huge windfall of cash by rejoining the agreement, this would be seen as a betrayal by the states in the region. In fact, uh, James Jeffrey, a, a, a never Trumper who became a Trump ambassador somehow, he recently retired, he has urged Biden to stick with Trump's Middle East policy. And he has said the states in the region will regret to see Trump leave office. So my hope is that Joe Biden will restrain the impulses to just get back in the deal and stick it to Trump or get back into the nuclear deal because it's an Obama deal. And instead, think hard about the implications for empowering Iran with all this cash, for rejoining a deal that is so fraudulent, and for starting something that could destroy a very successful, but very fragile process towards peace in the Middle East, started by the Trump administration. Biden should listen to Ambassador Jeffrey. Do not rejoin this terrible deal. Keep maximum pressure on Iran. I think it's, central, it's essential for American and for international security. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. And now if I could ask um, the other panelists to turn their cameras on as we enter the Q&A session. Thank you. I've received a, a number of good questions from the audience. Um, we have about 10 minutes or so. And if you have any further questions that you haven't asked, please type them in to the uh, question, ask the question feature uh, in the, um, in the uh, toolbox that you might see in front of you. The, the first question I would like to pose to the panelists though has to deal with our European partners. Uh, at the time of the deal in 2015, early 2016, um, European officials, of, and I'm sure everyone on this panel heard the same thing too, privately uh, European officials had a lot of uh, reservations about the deal, um, especially British and, and French officials speaking off the record. Uh, they were very critical, but yet their governments went along with it because they knew how important it was to President Obama, and they wanted to be seen as being good friends and, and allies of, of the United States. Now, with the situation not only changed in the Middle East, but also across Europe, with uh, transatlantic relations, with the UK no longer being in the European Union and not being constrained by that uh, EU 3 plus 3 format, um, and being a, able to take more of an independent uh, view and position. How do you think um, the U.S. Uh, can convince uh, our European partners, or how do you think our European partners can convince a Biden administration uh, on the best way forward in terms of the Iran deal? Because obviously uh, the Europeans still remain uh, chained to the corpse of the JCPOA, but I do believe that if the opportunity did arise, they would um, seek a new negotiated agreement. So I'll just throw that out there, whoever wants to go first. Okay, I could just start off, say a few words. Uh, you know, I think in some respects, the JCPOA was kind of a Rorschach test that was many things to many people. And, you know, those short sunset restrictions made no sense at all unless you presume that Iran was going to change. And I think part of the weakness of the deal was partly because the Obama administration saw it as transformational 
and they they were willing to uh, make sacrifices on the non-proliferation front because they thought they were going to reorient uh, Iran's foreign policy and it was magically going to be uh, moderated. Uh, but I think in the future, uh, uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk about uh, uh, we need to get back into multilateralism. And I think it is true. We should be listening to our allies, but the, our allies with the greatest skin in the game are in the Middle East, and they're universally were opposed to the JCPOA. And I think the Europeans should take time to listen to them uh, going forward. My two cents is that there's no difference between the Council on Foreign Relations globalist elites and the leaders of European states. They are just uh, obsessed with these multilateral agreements that are not in the interest of the United States. But Jim made the most important point. The U.S. was not isolated or withdrawing from the JCPOA. It was from Europe, but not from the states that matter, the states in the region who supported what we did. And they liked President Trump's uh, uh, policy. I, I don't doubt there are European states who think this agreement can be fixed. They're wrong. Iran's not going to renegotiate it. The sunset clause has nothing to do with fixing it. And my hope is that uh, Biden will recognize that and realize that he has to take another course. Thank you. Um, the next question is actually a very pithy question, which I, I like. Um, are there any aspects of the current agreement that you would want to keep that you think uh, are positive that we could build off? Maybe I should say something. I mean, again, from a nuclear expert's point of view, um, there are many parts that are, are very useful. It was useful to bring down the number of centrifuges, extend the breakout timelines. I mean, it, I understand Fred's point of view, and I've increasingly come to the view that, that the enrichment program should be ended in Iran, not limited. Um, I'm always told that that's not achievable, but but I actually agree with Fred on that, that we should try. Um, but nonetheless, having the breakout times increase, um, limiting the Iraq reactor, uh, Iraq reactor's ability to make weapon grade plutonium uh, was a plus, um, getting Iran to agree and implement the um, additional protocol. So I think there's various things in there that 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 are are have been useful um, and can be built on. But that being said, um, the deal overall couldn't really get to this fundamental issue of is Iran really being prevented from building nuclear weapons? And that's where it's lost a lot of its credibility. Thank what you. worries me about the agreement is that it legitimizes Iran's nuclear program and allows it to develop an industrial scale program. And I'm, I, I think David and I that had, used to have serious disagreements on nuclear issues, and I, we're increasingly thinking alike. Let's think about the Iraq heavy water reactor, it's spelled A-R-A-K. David is right, a decision was made to limit its capabilities to make weapons grade plutonium. Iran shouldn't have any weapons grade plutonium. Iran should not have a heavy water reactor. It built this in violation of his NPT vi uh, commitments. It is another example of why this deal is such a disaster. So I'd say in addition to no enrichment, I'd say no heavy water reactors that can make any plutonium. Thank you for that. Um, the next question is, um, is it accurate to say that Iran is now closer to having a nuclear weapon than in 2016? And how can you gauge the success of the maximum pressure campaign? Or how would you rate the success of the uh, maximum pressure campaign? Maybe I, I should say something first about the close. I mean, it, it's not clear at all um, that Iran is closer now than it was in 2016. I mean, what we've seen with this buildup was it didn't take long for Iran to dramatically reduce the breakout timelines once it decided to to not abide by the nuclear limitations anymore. Um, it it has been preserving its, in my view, its nuclear weapons capability, um, and and it was planning while the deal was on. In fact, implementing plans to be able to build large numbers of advanced centrifuges. Two developments since that time, not good from the point of view of my institute, but but reality, there was an explosion that took out 
this facility to assemble advanced centrifuges on a mass scale. Um, the leader of the Ahmad plan was recently killed. He's been running ever since the Ahmad plan successor organizations that appear to have um, are maintaining the capability to build nuclear weapons and, and were the place where the Ahmad people went to work. So I think that one of the changes has been, and I, and I have no idea what the motives were for these actions, but certainly um, there's an impatience with that the JCPOA in 2016 did not create enough space to nuclear weapons and that others are taking actions to try to increase that space increase that space or I should I would just address okay. oh, excuse me. I would just address the second part of the question about uh, you know what has maximum pressure produced and and many have I think prematurely concluded that it was a mistake because they hasn't produced a, a new agreement but I think that neglects the fact that the Iranians were determined to wait out uh, President Trump, uh, but they are still going to be under tremendous pressure to uh, make concessions if they want to get those sanctions off. And I think it would be a mistake to expect uh, any U.S. policy to produce results uh, in the Middle East according to a political timetable, at least a political timetable in terms of Washington's election schedule. Uh, you know, these things. Uh, uh, are much more, I think, rooted in Iran's politics than in our, our politics. I think Iran is closer to a weapon today than it was in 2016. We found this out from, from the Iran nuclear archive documents, but I also note that Iran was allowed to develop more advanced centrifuges under the nuclear deal, which meant it was improving its capability to make nuclear weapons fuel every day, every year, legally, under the agreement. And, and as Democrats sometimes say, well, Trump failed to stop Iran's nuclear weapons program. You know, there's a good way we could have done it. We could have attacked Iran, but Donald Trump didn't want to get the U.S. in unnecessary wars. Maximum pressure was the best way to deal with this program without going to war. And I think it was the right approach. Yeah, well, let me just add, I mean, and also, it, nuclear weapon has three pillars. One of the the central one is the ability to make weapon grade uranium and, and in the case of Iran at least. And Iran had a program in Ahmad called the Al Ghadir project, which essentially was the Ford Al enrichment plant. That's where they started to build it in the early 2000s. And it, and it took longer than expected. If you look at what Al Ghadir project intended to be able to do, Iran is now implementing the Al Ghadir project at at Fordow under safeguards, not quite configured to make weapon grade uranium, but it could be reconfigured to make weapon grade uranium on short order. So in that sense, it's been implementing parts of the Ahmad plan all along, while we've been thinking they've only been concentrating on civil nuclear power and have been staying away from nuclear weapons. Thank you. Those are all very good uh, points and contributions in answer to that question. Uh, one final question we, we have time for. Uh, if if the Biden administration decides to go back into JCPOA in a very blindly way, just straight into it without all these considerations that we discussed today, then what would the impact be on the recently developed uh, uh, normalizations between Israel and the four uh, other Arab states. How would it, how do you see um, going back into G, into the JCPOA impacting the current normalizations or prohibiting any future ones? Well, I would just say I, I think it, it will drive uh, Israel and many Sunni Arab states closer together, but also will lead them uh, to. Uh, much greater criticism of U.S. foreign policy, similar to what happened uh, after the 2015 agreement. Uh, so I think that that would be uh, uh, a, a tragic outcome. It, it would relieve pressure on Iran and uh, demoralize U.S. allies in the region. I, I agree with all that, but I would add that if Biden does this, 
and legitimizes Iran's nuclear program again and begins to appease Iran again, I think it's going to drive states in the region to develop their own nuclear weapons programs, at least to start enriching uranium and to build heavy water reactors. Saudi Arabia is already on the way to doing this. Basically, I think states in the region are going to say if the U.S. is not going to have principles, uh, some of these states are going to have to take their security in their own hands. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks for that, Fred and Jim. Um, and of course, the last thing uh, we want after winning the Cold War is to give the next generation uh, a nuclear arms race in one of the most unstable and volatile regions uh, in the world. Um, I, that's it for time, I'm afraid. I would like to thank our panelists for sharing their insights on this challenge and uh, the future of the JCPOA. And I'd like to thank our audience for joining us for this very important conversation. Uh, immediately following this event, you'll receive a survey that we hope you'll complete so that we can bring, our, bring ideas that you care about to the public square. Uh, also, the, a recording of this event will be made available online at heritage.org backslash events uh, in the next uh, 24 hours, I believe. And to see uh, the events that we have coming up, go and check out that same website, heritage.org backslash events, uh, to see what we have in the pipe. Again. Thank you uh, for joining us and thanks to our panelists and have a great day.